In 1971, uh, one of my former professors, Thomas Fitzpatrick, testifying before a Senate committee, essentially killed the U.S. plans to build a fleet of supersonic transport planes. And he did this by saying that these planes, the nitrogen exhaust from these planes, would damage the ozone layer. This is before anybody knew anything about chlorofluorocarbons, 1971, and would cause a rapid rise in cases of, of malignant melanomas. Tom Fitzpatrick was the world expert in melanomas. And that was the end, essentially, of the SST. And to a young physician like myself, three years out of medical school, to have a physician determine the fate of a project with huge financial and national interest by addressing environmental and public health concerns was really a seminal event and started me thinking about the fact that there needed to be physicians involved in protecting the environment, that we were perhaps among the most powerful and effective advocates because ultimately environmental issues were issues of human health. So fast forward seven years. I'm a third year resident at the Mass General. Uh, I come across Helen Caldicott and a man named Ira Helfand, physician named Ira Helfand, and we decided to focus our attention on nuclear power. And we started this group, Physicians for Social Responsibility, in 1978. We were a small group, mostly academics. We were meeting in churches and basements. But an amazing thing happened. We took out an ad in the New England Journal of Medicine on March 28, 1979, announcing the rebirth of Physicians for Social Responsibility and talking about the medical consequences of nuclear power. That ad came out on the very day that there was a partial core meltdown of the Three Mile Island nuclear reactor in Pennsylvania. 250,000 physicians got their issue of the New England Journal, and we became a national organization in two weeks with thousands of members. So I was very concerned about nuclear power, but I was very, very afraid of nuclear war and offered to put together a conference on the medical consequences of nuclear war, which we did in February of 1980. And that was two months after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and during the campaign uh, for the presidency. Uh, and there was a lot of talk about nuclear war. That, uh, that was at Harvard's uh, Science Center Lecture Hall B. The hall was packed. And there was so much interest after that conference that we decided to take out a full page ad, not in the New England Journal, but in the New York Times. 700 people signed that uh, uh, full page letter. It was an open letter to President Carter and Chairman Brezhnev, uh, warning them about the medical consequences of nuclear war and asking for their help in helping us put together an organization of physicians from the US and Soviet Union to protect, to prevent a nuclear war. They responded very positively, and in June of 1980, four of us, uh, Bernard Lown, Herb Abrams, Jim Muller, and myself, all Harvard faculty members, later to be joined by three Soviet colleagues, started this organization that won the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize. And if you look at that upper picture, that guy with hair holding the medal is me. <clears throat> Hard to believe, 25 years ago. So, Here's what's interesting uh, for me, is that in 1986, Gorbachev came to power. The danger of nuclear war uh, between the superpowers which was much less at that time. And this was the very same time that the ozone hole was discovered over the Antarctic. And the scientific literature began talking about the threat, potential threat of climate change. So several of us physicians who were involved in the anti-nuclear physicians movement started seeing these global environmental changes as, quote, Armageddon in slow motion. And that these changes were much, much harder than nuclear war for people to grasp. They were more abstract. They were significantly more complicated scientifically. And we had no Hiroshima's or Nagasaki's to serve as models. And therefore, we felt it, it was even more important for physicians and public health professionals to be involved in helping the public grasp what these issues meant by translating, if you will, the abstract and technical science of these global environmental issues into 
the concrete, personal, everyday language of human health. So again, fast forward to the Rio Summit, 1992. Climate Change Convention, the Biodiversity Convention were formed there. People asked me what I, as a physician, was doing attending an environmental meeting, which was an interesting question. But there was almost no discussion about human health at the Rio Summit, if you recall. Very interesting. So we published a book with MIT Press called Critical Condition about health and the environment. And I finally got the chance, 25 years after listening to Tom Fitzpatrick, to start an organization of physicians that would work to protect the global environment, this Center for Health and the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School. It was the first and still the only such center in the country that did this. What was interesting about the early 90s was that even then there was interest among physicians and public health professionals about the issue of climate change, heat waves, infectious disease uh, ranges changing, but there was not the same attention for the loss of biological diversity. And being a, a lifelong naturalist who spent most of my childhood looking through my microscope at pond water, I decided that this is what I was going to do for my next uh, several decades. So began to work on the human health consequences of the loss of biological diversity. And that's that book that Steve gave a wonderful plug to, completely uh, unexpected, um, Sustaining Life. And you can't really see it, but that's me in Colombia, uh, Bogota, holding a little uh, tree frog. So we're enormously proud of that book. I would be absolutely delighted if all of you bought a copy. I will <laughs> promise to meet you at Casablanca or any place of your choice and sign it. And that's what brings me here today.